would like to share it with you today. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you for life. We thank you that we have the ability to listen to your words and serve you. Lord, we thank you that you have sustained us through another week. We thank you that despite all the chaos that is going on in the world, you are working it out. And Lord, at this moment in time, I invite your Holy Spirit to fill this place. May we have ears that are open so that we can hear what the Spirit has to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for coming to Scottsdale Thunderbird. Um, I am extremely humbled to be up here with, uh, to deliver the message today. Again, if you don't know me, um, I'm one of the church members here, um, Dennis Osenia, and I just want to, again, thank my family for being here. It seems that every time that I do get up to preach, which is very rare, um, my family always has my back, and again, I... I feel like I have no other words I need to say, um, but thank you for already blessing us with your music today. And uh, again, um, Pastor Dave and his family are heading to the Holy Land, which is an exciting thing. And uh, I have been, can I uh, have the clicker please? We have been blessed over the last couple weeks to get a series from him about families. And that is one of the things that I, our family, has been so blessed with here at Scottsdale Thunderbird is that you have embraced us, you have treated us like one of your own, and at the, that's what I love about this church, is we are a family. And he was talking about Abraham and Sarah and kind of going through their story in Genesis, Genesis 12, 13, 14, and then he skipped 15 and got 16, right? But basically, God promises Abraham, in all the families of the earth, will be blessed through your, your ministry and your service and your faithfulness. And we're included in that, right? And it's with the transforming grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we can be a good family, even though we have some difficulties, we can extend and be a light to the world to show what grace is truly about in a very divided world. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Do you need freedom and liberty today? But we all, including all of us here with unveiled face, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And so I was inspired by his messages over the last couple weeks. And, you know, the, the question that came to mind that how does this work? How does that work for someone like me? How do I get transformed because it's nice to say but as we leave these doors how does that happen but before we go into that we i just like in scott stealthenberg fashion we're gonna have a kids quiz this one's pretty easy but it will kind of give us a hint to the the topic of what we're going to be talking about today so Jaden, thank you so much first question how many books are in the Bible? Is it two? 66? 88? Is it just one? Anybody? Who, who's got it? One of those boys right there, yeah. 66. 66? I think you're right. 66 books in the Bible. Now, between the Old and the New Testament, how many books are in the Old Testament, and how many are in the New Testament? Is it an equal 33 and 33? Is it 28 and 38? 39 and 27? 42? 24? 39 and 27. Oh, man, these kids know their Bible. Awesome. <laughs> you are correct. 
<laughs> Last question here. The Bible reveals what to us? God's character, the future. You guys can't answer. You guys, I know you guys are cheating. You can see my slides. The history of the world, Jesus Christ. Can you get up here in the front, Jaden? Your brother. I, I promise he didn't look at my slides before, or did you? Did you? D. Huh? D. D. Okay. E? No, D. D, okay. D's one. Anybody else have another answer? There's one right. All of the above. All of the above. You're right. I kind of tricked you there. It is all of the above. So today we're going to be talking about the Bible. And um, I know this is a weird intro to, to talk about the Bible. But in 2020, we all went through it. Um, it was a very difficult time for many of us. The world was shut down. There's a lot of things that changed in that year. And during that time, a lot of things were closed. I know my family hasn't seen these pictures, but I wanted to put them up there because this is family church, right? We had to do a lot of things indoors in our homes, and we had a lot of time to do some workouts. Um, this is actually a video if it'll play. Oh, no. Is it going to play? Maybe not. You see me going to help me there. This is us trying to stay healthy during uh, the pandemic. It's okay. No worries if it's not going to play. Um, but another exercise that I like to do, if you guys know me already. Um, oh. <laughs> it's all good. Let's go to the next slide. There. One of the, the activities that I like to do, and it's, I don't like lifting weights, I don't like running, I don't like doing all those things. However, I do a really easy sport in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's really super easy. It's, I, we really call it aggressive hugging. It's, it's not really anything too you know, crazy at all, but I, I have been doing this since actually 2001. No, I'm not a black belt. I just have casually participated in it. But that guy in the top right corner is a, a PA that I, I got to know doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. His name is John, and at one point, he's probably going to watch this. He's like, why are you doing this? I don't look like that anymore. I'm not that helpless. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was in those roles that John, that John posed a question to me. This was during 2020. And he went, you know, it's weird the times we're living in, right? It's kind of weird what's going on. And he's a Christian. And I'm like, yeah, that is pretty interesting. What do you think is going on? And he's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I know I study the Bible and stuff, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting on what's going on. And so my, my uh, caveman there to the very left is my really good friend, Kiyoki, my brother from Hawaii. He's, um, we've done a lot of ministry together. And I knew that he was, he's a Bible worker. He's been doing Bible studies. And I asked, hey, Kiyoki, uh, John wants to know why the world is the way it is. And I said, okay. He's like, let's study. And April 25, I had to look this up. I have it set in my Google calendar. We, couldn't, we weren't able to go into church. And so we had Bible study for the first time. And throughout that time, me and we would go to his house, and we would go every Friday night or Saturday morning, and we would just study the Bible and kind of answer the questions that he had. And when we were studying, it made me have to reflect a little bit more on myself about what do I really know about the Bible? Because I've been raised Adventist Christian my whole life. I went to Sabbath school, I have did all these things, I've, done I've been part of evangelistic series. I show up to church, and we open the Bible, and I should really know the answers to his questions, right? But I didn't. I didn't know. There were some things that just weren't clear. And since that time, I, God has put me on a journey of studying his word. It has been one of the most fruitful things 
that I have ever done in my life. And it's because the way we started to structure the Bible studies is that we started to connect the pieces. My, my friend had a, a way of how he delivered Bible studies, and, and we got through most of them, but then when I moved from California to here, I ended up having to take over to help write some of the studies. And each of the studies connect one to another. They build on each other. And for me, being a very structured and organized thinker, this really helped me in my Bible study. And so it started to connect the pieces. I started to learn about the, the, the subjects that we had talked about my whole life and why they meant so much and why people were being transformed, right? And so I continued to study. I continued to dedicate time in the Word of God because I didn't know. I didn't know what I thought I knew. And so some of the time, some of the questions that people ask, and I didn't know how to give an answer. I'm a Christian, right? I, I've been in church this whole time. I should be able to answer these very easy questions, right? You guys have an answer. I know you have an answer. If I asked you here, you, knew, you would know how to answer, right? But when people ask you, well, what is the Bible? Or can the Bible even be trusted? Why is the Bible important for my life? What is it all about? You have an answer, right? You know what to say? I didn't know what to say. I had something that I saw in a sermon that, oh, yes, this is the Bible, 66 books, 39, 27, reveals all that stuff we talked about in the kids' quiz, right? But I didn't know. And so, and, and the reason why, I knew the content, I knew the overall subject material, but sometimes I couldn't answer why I believed it. Do you ever have that question? Why do I even believe what I believe? Why is Jesus important to me? And through these studies, I started to get my question of why answered. And so what is the Bible? Again, this is just kind of taking you through my first study that I ever did. When we say, what is the Bible? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training, and righteousness. The Bible is the Word of God. Period. It is the Word of God. It is not pages and ink in a book. It is the Word of God. And so why is God's Word so important. Why do we want to study this and know his word? In Luke 6, 45, it says, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from which fills his heart. In another translation, out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. You want to know the heart of God? You have to hear it from his word. The heart of God is, in, is contained in these stories, these events in the Bible, throughout history. The heart of God is a beautiful thing. But you can't take my word for it. You have to know it for yourself. That's why a personal relationship with God is so important. It can't be through second or third hand knowledge. It has to be personal and one on one with him. But can it be trusted? So you tell me to read this in his book. You tell me to read his word. He's going to tell me everything I need to know. But can the Bible be trusted? Just like that kid trust his dad to jump off that rock. Isaiah, don't do this. Listen. Hey, we're in church. Listen. 
Sorry, I'm still going to be dad too, right? <laughs> hey, thanks for that object lesson. Thanks for not paying attention so I could do that object lesson. So that's great. <laughs> but can the Bible be trusted, right? Well, who wrote the Bible? For Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. But know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's what? Own private interpretation. What's another, what's another word for that? It's not somebody's opinion, right? The bi- this is not a book of opinions. For prophecy was ever made by the act, it was, for no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by what? The Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Holy Spirit moved these men to write the Word of God. So, God is in control of it all. He's working it out. He worked it out through the writing of His Word throughout history so that today, in 2023, we can still know His Word. And hence the the title, and I I will make a little nudge at Betty, because you may be looking at your bulletin, and it says, search in, search in for for reliable sources, and then the sermon title inside says, searching for resources, but the title was, search for reliable resources. (laughs) I love you, Betty. She is our church secretary. She does a lot of work for us, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you for what you do. But this is, what the, this is what the world is typing in their Google, right? Is where's the reliable sources at? How can I know I can trust something, right? Because we're inundated with so much information. You want to know something? YouTube it. You don't even say go look it up anymore. YouTube it. Google it. That's, it. that's, that's our vernacular now, right? We don't even go, I, I, I guess we're kind of, how many went to the encyclopedia? Nobody know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I ha- you know the Encyclopedia Britannica. Our kids are like, what is going? I don't know what that is. We had to look it up. We had to flip through pages, and and we had to write down and copy with a typewriter, right? Like doing this. Oh, I messed up. Got to get a new paper. And... But the world is giving us so much information. There's so much out there, and how can you trust what's out there, right? My profession, I'm a healthcare professional. My wife's a healthcare professional. We've been in medicine a long time, um, nursing a long time. I know we have some other healthcare professionals here. You know, people say, well, the Bible was written by man. How can we trust what man has written? Well, what information do you get that is not written by a man or a woman? Everything is written by it, right? Medicine was built on people studying things and saying that this seems to work. But is medicine 100% perfect? And I'm not saying this because I am a healthcare provider. <laughs> we don't always get it right, unfortunately. That's why they call it a practice, right? <laughs> Some people lead a little more practice than others, but you know. But you don't throw away medicine, right? You don't throw away the healthcare field. You still trust them despite their deficiencies, correct? We need it. We need healthcare today, right? But the level of trust you put into something determines on what? The source, right? Do you trust your doctor? Do you trust your nurse practitioner? Do you trust the people that take care of you? How do you develop that trust? You got to get to know them, right? You don't just... Here, I'm going to write down all these medications for you. Go ahead, take this. And you're like, I don't know you. Am I supposed to? T- what is all this stuff, right? Your level of trust depends on the source. And the source, and, 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 and God doesn't expect us to just follow blindly, right? What is, as kids, what's the thing that you don't like your parents telling you when they tell you to do something? Do, what? I, because I, do I do that, Jaden? <laughs> that was not what we worked out. <sighs> oh, man. So I do it too. <laughs> but we hate it when they say, just do it because I told you so. 
that doesn't answer the why question, does it? In the Bible, it says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Is that a because I told you kind of statement? He wants to invite you. Tell me what your idea is. What do you see in this? Let's reason together. He does not require blind submission. He wants to give you the reasons why you should believe in him and that a life with him is worth it. The Bible is the reliable source for us who follow Christ. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the word, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know these things, what? Freely given to us by who? He's not one that wants to keep the information to himself. He wants to freely give it to you if you're willing to ask. Which these things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. The Bible is the reliable source. Why? Because the source of its wisdom is God's and God's alone. It is by no private interpretation. It's not by any man's opinion. What you read in this book is the word of God. Do you believe that? It is the word of God. And why is this important for me? Why is this important for you? In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, but sanctify. Does anybody, that's not a word that we use a lot. Well, maybe in Adventist culture we do. We don't use sanctify a lot. But it means to set apart for a holy purpose. And it says, sanctify Christ as Lord where? In your heart. Set it apart for a holy purpose. Always being ready to make a defense. A lot of Christians, a lot of Adventist Christians like to put the period right there. I'm ready to defend my faith. Like it's ready to go. It's time, uh, jujitsu type stuff. Like I'm ready to fight, right? But the period doesn't, it, the, the phrase goes on. It says, always be ready to make a defense to any, everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And how do you do that? By beating them with the Bible? Read the rest of the verse. It says, with gentleness and reverence. The way that we are to sanctify God and show the world that we believe in this God is to let them know I have hope in Jesus because he's transformed my life. The question is, do you know the hope that is in you? Do you know that there is hope? The Word of God speaks. I have been so blessed since I started this journey. I have, I am, I, again, I'm a healthcare professional. This is not my area of expertise, but I started studying the Bible, and I started studying it with whoever wanted to study it with me. And I have about six or seven studies going on right now with people here in this church, um, some people still in California through Zoom, through people that I have found, family members. And to be honest, it's not about what I can share with them, it's what we can share with each other. They get to share with me the hope of Jesus in them, and I get inspired because I'm like, man, I didn't know there was that kind of hope. Man, I'm glad he gave you that hope because you've given that to me. The word of God speaks. He speaks through his word, and then he speaks through you. But I think at this point in time, at this juncture in earth's history, we'll do a little call out to our, our own denomination. 
As Adventists, we have prided ourselves in the ones that dig deep into the word. But have we stopped? Do we still continue to dig? Do we think that we've gotten all the answers because we know prophecy? Do you know everything there is to know in this Bible and every exact way it should be said? In today's time, what we need to do in order to get through this time is to continue to dig. We need to be a faith of digging into God's word like we once were. Sometimes I think we've gotten a little comfortable. We know what we know. And so we're happy with that. We're comfortable with that. But what does the world see when they look at us? Do they see us being complacent? Do they see us not really studying our word anymore? Because they have questions, and we should be the ones who are digging to give the answer. We should be that church. And I have been blessed by so many of you in this church because you guys are diggers. You have expanded my mind. You have shown me more in this word that I didn't know was in there. I've had conversations with Dean Mark. Man, he's, I love the way he views the Bible. George, I've, I've, he I've heard him speak in, in Sabbath school. John, Pastor Ryan, your vision and perspective of the Bible has expanded my vision of God and has blessed me. And I'm going to, we're getting to a close here. I have to, she didn't want me to do this, but I have, to, I have to brag on my wife a little bit. And I actually have to recognize Nassim for giving me this quote. It says, where you stand determines what you see and what you do not see. It determines also the angle you see it from. A change on where you stand changes everything. I have stood as an Adventist Christian in one spot, I think, for too long. It's not that I'm saying we're leaving the church. I promised Pastor Dave I wouldn't <laughs> destroy this church with my, with my sermon, but I think we need just to angle our perspective a little bit because he calls us to be people that bear one another's burdens. And if we can't understand what people are going through, we may miss it. We may miss an opportunity to share hope that should be in us. I love my wife. She loves to hike. For those of you who know her, she, there's a story. Sorry. <laughs> her dad told me a story. So me and my wife, if you haven't heard our testament, I, I've known Jay since uh, we were 11, 10, 12 years old. And our dads actually lived on the same street in the Philippines growing up. So our families knew of each other, but we didn't meet till 11, 12 years old. But her dad would tell me the story that Jay, ever since she was probably smaller than Isaiah, loved to climb mountains. She would, the little hills and, you know, the little hills and mounds in the park, she needed to get to the top. And <laughs> she still likes to do that today. And I understand why she likes to do that. Because it changes her perspective on how she sees the world. And how she sees God. She always tells me, you cannot go to the tops of these places. This is in Yosemite. Is that Cloud's Rest? So that's Cloud's Rest. Um, she did Half Dome as well. But she says when she goes to these places, you cannot help but believe that there is a God. And so I believe that where we stand changes everything. Are we still where we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Or have we continued to dig and get to know God deeper? When I was, um, I used to work in the ER and I was a nurse educator in the ER. Um, I was helping with process improvement. Hospitals always need process improvement to make things better, right? And I, I learned how to do lean management and waste, root cause analysis, and blah, blah, blah. But they always told me, when you do these kinds of things, you always have to know what your true north is. Know where you're going so that everything that you do to 
make change and improvement, you're still heading in the right direction. Do you know what the true north is for the Christian? Do you know what the true north is for studying the Bible? When you're studying the Bible, when you're trying to deliver um, a Bible study or learn more about it, what is your true north? I think it's found in the last book in the Bible. The last book in the Bible is the summary of everything else in the Bible. And the very first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is your true north. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his bondservants. The things that, which must soon take place, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. It says, blessed is he who reads, he who hears, and he who keeps or heeds the words of this book. Where are you heading today? Is your true north, is your compass a little off? Come back through Jesus. I'm going to let my family sing one more song for us, and we will close with prayer. It's a good one. It's a hymn, kind of old school, but I figure that it is a good thing to sing in times like these.